Sorry, Lloyd. Lloyd, Lloyd, I have to interrupt you. You have another device playing in your facility. Please stop all devices aside the one that's sharing, the one you are using for echo right now. There's somebody else with echo in the same room, so we are getting an echo. <laughs> Yeah, you can continue. Thank you. Hello, how is it now? It's better. Okay. So should I, start, should I start afresh? No, no, no. It's okay. We can read. Okay. So uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis B surface antigen came out positive. This client did not have a history of multiple sexual partners, no history of blood transfusions. We initiated the patient on lamiputin only when we got the hepatitis B uh, results. Uh, on examination, the patient was a late and ambulant. His BP was 110 over 66 millimeters of mercury, pulse 84 beats per minute, temperature 37 degrees Celsius, weight 42 kgs. He was mildly pale and jaundiced. His chest was clear. Cardiovascular megaly. His liver span was about eight centimeters below the costal margin. Uh, then we ordered we ordered uh, lab tests such as white blood cell, uh, a full blood count, which gave us a white blood cell of uh, nine point two, hemoglobin uh, of eight point one, MCV of uh, ninety. MCH of 30, platelet count of 109, creatinine of 478.40, creatinine clearance was calculated, his weight was 42. So his creatinine clearance came to 9.59. AST was done as well, it was 68. ALT was 25.4. Hepatitis B. Uh, Yes, it's okay. We can hear you. We had a bit of a problem, but we understand that you were not able to do the other panels for hepatitis B, and neither were you able to be a viral load, and we don't have an ultrasound. So we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, the next slide uh, we, we, this just shows that we calculated the upper score, and it came out to 2.08. Okay. The aspartate uh, to platelet ratio, uh, index ratio, gave us a reading of 2.08. Thank you, Lloyd. So that's our, that's our. Now we have got two points. Uh, we would like to know your, ex, your expert opinion on treating such patients with, uh, without having uh, such. Okay. Hello. Oh, yes, Lloyd. Thank you very much. I'll summarize your. Thank you. 
So this question is, what is your expert opinion on treating such patients? If you don't have other ways of checking the hepatitis, you only have a, a positive hepatitis B surface antigen, you have, an, you have ascites, they are not able to do the viral load, they are not able to do the other tests for hepatitis. What would be the best way to treat these patients? And um, if yes, um, what treatment would be put together for him. At the moment, the patient is only on lamivudine because the creatinine clearance was only 9. The APRI score was 2.08. Are there any questions for Kaoma? <clears throat> Even from the hub? So we've had a bit of internet challenges with Kaoma. We have a 51-year-old man with ascites, has a positive hepatitis but he's actually HIV negative. When they've examined him, he has fluid in the abdomen. He has a big spleen. The platelet is 109. The creatinine is 478. His kidneys are not working well, okay? And uh, his AST is 68. What, what should we do with this patient? What should we do with patients where we are unable to, to do all the um, hepatitis B tests but seems to have something going well? Going on. Anyway, I don't want to preempt you. Do we have any contributions from our network? I realize that this patient is HIV negative, but typically in our setting, when there's a hepatitis B patient, they're actually referred to ART because the drugs we use are the same. So we're expected to know a bit about hepatitis B. Um, so there's a question from Dr. Rakaya. She says, are there any repeat bloods, especially the creatinine? Lloyd? Okay. So Lloyd, did you repeat the creatinine at any point? Okay, so what I know, Dr. Rakaya, is they did other creatinine test, they did about a panel of three, and actually it didn't improve. It was not much better. Maybe you'd get to a creatinine clearance of 10. They did three others. Uh, we have Mr. Kamfwa. Please go ahead with your question. Yes, I wanted to basically find out the dosage of lamivudine which was uh, used on the client. Because I have uh, noted uh, on the creatinine cl uh, clearance, it's uh, 9.7. So I mainly wanted to find out the dosage which they were using for, for the lamivudine. Okay, that's a very good question. Thank you. Lloyd, how much lamivudine were you using for your patient? We used a low dose of lamivudine of 75 milligrams once daily. Okay, thank you. So they use 75 milligrams just because he has a poor creating clearance. Any other questions in case I'm not seeing a hand? Any contributions from the network? Okay, so we'll ask our experts to zero in on this case or at least to ask any questions. Dr. Nsokolo from Levy, do you have any questions from, for our team in Kaoma? Dr. Nsokolo from Levy, do you have any contributions or questions? Can you hear me? We can hear you very well and see you too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my question is, why wasn't the abdominal ultrasound done? That's a very good question. Lloyd? Hello. Why did Hello. we do the abdominal ultrasound? Uh, we couldn't do the abdominal ultrasound because it was down. Oh, thank you so much, Lloyd. So it was a constraint. They, 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 it was not working, Dr. Nsokolo. Okay. 
So would you like to zero in on the case, Dr. Ansokolo? Any comments? Maybe we can answer Lloyd's first question. Okay. So, hello? Yes, we can hear you and see you very well. Would you want us to answer the question now or after the presentation? You have to answer it now, because after the presentation, Chaisa has its own questions. So you can just comment on the case, your opinion. Okay. Um, my opinion is that uh, this patient indeed may have had uh, cirrhosis, but um, uh, looking at the place where the patient uh, is, uh, it was difficult for them to establish whether the patient had cirrhosis or not. Now, for us to start treatment, um, we need to know the the AOT, which of course was normal. We need to know the viral load, which has to be more than 2,000. And of course, the viral, uh, the, uh, the, the, whether the patient has cirrhosis or not. In the case where there is cirrhosis, regardless of the viral load, we start treatment. So I guess the assumption here was that this patient has cirrhosis, which of course may have been a wrong thing. And then looking at the setup where this patient is, chances of them again, the patient having um, uh, schisto is also quite high. So you may find that you are treating a patient who you think has cirrhosis, when in the actual sense, the patient actually has schistosomiasis. The hepatitis B may not be at a stage where the patient needs treatment. So I guess this could have been better done uh, with all the things done so that we establish whether this patient really has cirrhosis or not, and we start uh, treatment. Then I know that the most difficult thing was the drug to choose because the drug of choice is uh, tenofovir. But because of the renal dysfunction, uh, they made a choice to start with lamivudine. But lamivudine, as we all know, is that uh, seven, more than 70% of people that are given lamivudine in um, uh, hepatitis B infection, they develop resistance after about five years. So it's not really recommended to start uh, patients on lamivudine because of the high chance of them developing resistance after some Thank years of taking it. Thank you so much, Dr. Nsokolo. However, I just feel like this situation is more common than not for people that are far. I work at an advanced treatment center and what I have is a hepatitis B surface antigen as well. And maybe an ultrasound reliable I don't know, that one I can't say. But I think they had one powerful tool with them, which is the positive hepatitis B surface antigen. And I think I really like that you are saying we should not be too quick to treat hepatitis B. And this is the situation we are having in most parts of our country. But the issue we are actually. Teaching of. So I think the issue that Lloyd is faced with is there is no way he's going to get a viral load on this patient. It's very, very expensive. He can't get anything else on this patient aside the hepatitis B. And I like that you pointed out that Kaoma is in Western province. They have high rates of schistosomiasis, which can cause a picture like this, isn't it? So Dr. Vinikra, what's your comment on these patients? Because this case is not unique. We see a lot of this in our country where people have hepatitis B surface antigen, then they can't afford the other parts of the, the, the panel. Do you want to comment on this? Hope everyone Sorry, can, hear me. can you hear yes, me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, I would just say that um, an ultrasound is generally available in district hospitals. And it provides a lot of information, as Dr. Sokolos just said. It can help you know if there's cirrhosis. It can also check for schistosomiasis. And the third thing, which I was worried about when I heard this case, was liver cancer, because you mentioned that the liver was large. Usually, a cirrhotic liver is shrunken. So if you could palpate such a big liver, that would worry me that there's a tumor inside. So with, uh, with one single ultrasound, you can get all that information. And then my second comment is that um, as part of the didactic, either this time or on the second part, I will be able to teach everyone how to 
treat hepatitis without any of those expensive tests. I know that you, everyone wants to follow the guidelines coming out of Europe and the US, but in 2019 in Zambia, we have to adapt those guidelines to our setting. And with the basic tools that you have at any HIV clinic, you can also manage hepatitis B and I'll be teaching you how to do that. Okay, thank you. Th thank you, Michael. So I believe they said the few, they thought the liver span was eight centimeters. So maybe normal size rather than big. I don't know, what's your comment? Oh, okay, yeah. If, it, if the liver was felt to be normal or small, then I would, I would not be concerned about cancer as much. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, what about, what's your comment on the lamuvidine? I know Dr. Ansokolo commented on it. So since this facility has started treating this patient um, on lamuvidine, and somehow have decided to treat it. Should they be using lamivudine or should they go for tenofovam? How, how, what would be the approach to this? Because this is common. I agree with Dr. Nsokolo that um, if you decide to treat this patient, lamivudine is the way to go. But that being said, you would hope to monitor the kidney function and understand why it's low and hoping that in the future it improves to the point where you could switch them to tenofovir. Um, the patient okay. won't, re they won't develop resistance right away, but it's true that after a few years, especially with gaps in adherence, they would develop resistance. But I think for an initial starting plan, uh, lamivudine is fine, and lamivudine does not cause resistance to tenofovir later. So later you could switch without any problem. Okay, thank I you wouldn't want to take a chance with tenofovir. I wouldn't even chance TAF new tenofovir in this patient because it sounds like he's you know very close to needing a dialysis okay thank you very much dr cassidy yes thank you uh and once again thank you for the opportunity to be here and participate in this echo conference uh, i would just add on just a, a element of the renal function that the patient also needs clearly a workup for why he has chronic kidney disease assuming that this is chronic uh, of course, it could be related to liver disease, but he needs, in addition to his uh, liver workup, he needs a full kidney workup, and so, so that that can be assessed and uh, treated appropriately as well. And if, uh, as has been elucidated, so I think actually in the, given the tools at hand, the choice to treat the mivudine is appropriate. Of course, the dose of 75 milligrams, normal dose for hepatitis B is 100 milligrams. 75 is okay, but you'd probably be also be fine with the 100 in this case. And it, hopefully, as has been said, if you can treat with lamivudine at this point in time, uh, then as you assess the kidney disease, you can get that under control and make a switch later on when that is needed. And you won't lose the capacity to treat with tenofovir down the line by using lamivudine up front now. Okay. Thank you very much. Lloyd, are you still with us? So in summary, uh, I think what we've been told by our experts um, is that we need to rule out other potential causes of um, a cirrhotic liver or liver damage, especially schisto in your setting. So an abdominal ultrasound would be ideal. If it's schistosomiasis, you'll be able to see peripotal fibrosis. If it's cirrhosis, maybe due to hepatitis B, you actually see damage and fibrosis in the lung parenchyma. Uh, it seems we have agreed that we can go ahead and use 3TC, the lamivid in 75 milligrams. If you want, you can go to 100 milligrams just because his renal function is, is way from being ideal. However, in the long term, we should be targeting to use tenof of our tough when his kidney function improves. So I hope that's helpful, Lloyd. Unfortunately, I can't get more feedback from you. Uh, Michael, are you able to share your screen? I'm going to the, the didactic presentation. Yes, I can share it. Let's see. Yeah. Lloyd, are you with us? Hello. Yes, uh, you, Did you hear the recommendations for an ultrasound and to monitor his kidney function? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, I've, I've, I've been taking note of that. Okay, well done, thank you. Mm -hmm. Michael, you can go ahead. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it very well. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm Dr. Mike Vinicor, and uh, I am not currently in Zambia. I'm in Tanzania at the moment, but um, I lived in Zambia for about six years working with partners at UTH and at CIDRS. Um, and my main clinical focus and research focus was hepatitis B. And so I think a lot of the clinical challenges you're all facing, I've also had to face them. And um, the title of this talk is uh, Hepatitis B in Zambia, What Healthcare Workers Need to Know. So I was asked to develop a two-part series about hepatitis B for the Project ECHO. This is the first part, and I will be focusing on a general overview. The second part will be more focused on managing cases by the clinician. So uh, I apologize in advance for those who want to jump into the clinical management. I felt, I feel it's more important to start with a general overview so I can debunk some myths that are still common among clinicians and other health workers. So the learning objectives, number one, to become aware of the burden of infection both in Zambia and globally. Number two, to understand how can HBV or hepatitis B be transmitted and what's the most likely way it's transmitted in Zambia. Number three, to identify the most affected populations that you might want to target for testing or screening using the surface antigen test. And number four, um, which I think is very important to all of us health workers, learn how we can protect ourselves against HPV, and I have no significant financial disclosures or conflicts of interest to disclose. Okay. All right, so for background, hepatitis B is not new. Ministry of Health in Zambia has already made several interventions to uh, reduce the burden of hepatitis B in the population. And the so the first thing I always tell people is that um, even if you aren't very aware of it or you're not very um, comfortable managing it, the Ministry of Health is well aware of hepatitis B and has already made several uh, interventions uh, specifically for hepatitis B. So in 2006, the hepatitis B vaccine was incorporated into the under five EPI immunization program. Uh, which means that nearly all the infants who are born after 2006 had very good protection against the virus. And number two, there has been universal screening of blood donors since the early 2000s, and this has prevented a large number of uh, infections. In fact, according to Dr. Mulenga from the National Blood Bank, um, they have to dispose of more blood because of hepatitis B than they do for HIV. Um, my second point is that despite these interventions, HBV is still very common in Zambia, and I'll show you a slide about that in a second. And then the third background point is that I know very well from my experience that health workers in Zambia don't receive a lot of training about hepatitis B, how to test, when to test, how to treat, how to manage patients, and also how to prevent it. Um, and so I've tried to keep some of these slides very simple. So I know, I think everyone is aware of the Zamfia study. Zamfia was a, a massive um, survey done in a cross-sectional fashion in all 10 provinces um, approximately two years ago, two and a half years ago. And Zamfia in the hepatitis B world was, was wonderful as well because the Ministry of Health insisted on including a hepatitis B test along with the HIV testing that was done. And so for the first time, we had some estimates as to how many people had hepatitis B surface antigen in the population. And so according to the estimates from Zambia, there are approximately 540,000 individuals in Zambia with an active infection, which means they were hepatitis B surface antigen positive. Um, some have HIV, but as I hope you can see on the right circle, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but the green box says HBV mono infection. 
So you can see from this diagram that these two circles, the larger circle represents HIV, the slightly smaller circle represents hepatitis B, and then this part of the circle is HIV only, this part is hepatitis B only, and then in the middle is patients with both infections. So I'll let you stare at that for a minute. But what I want you to take away from this slide is that um, HBV is about half as common as HIV. Number two, that co-infection, where a person has both HBV and HIV, is very common. There's a lot of overlap. And number three, that most of the time, just like our case from Kaoma, when you find a patient who has hepatitis B, most of the time they will actually be HIV negative. So those are the, those are the, those are the takeaways from this slide. And then on a global scale, there are 240 million cases of chronic hepatitis B, again, indicated by a surface antigen positive test. So on a global level, chronic hepatitis B is almost 10 times as common as HIV. Most of the cases are actually in Africa and Asia. So these are the focus areas for global hepatitis interventions. So you can see in the blue, if we just look at Africa for a second, you can see that West Africa is darker blue and Southern Africa and Eastern Africa are kind of medium blue. And so West Africa actually has the highest rate of hepatitis B in the world. So Zambia has a fair, fairly high proportion with chronic hepatitis B, but it's nothing compared to West Africa where it's much more common. Okay, so I want to teach you a bit about the hepatitis B life cycle. So um, if we go back to HIV for a minute, because I know that ECHO is very focused on HIV, we know that the HIV virus enters into the CD4 T cell and it results in uh, activation of the T cell and death of the T cell. And that as the number of T cells in your body diminishes, as the CD4 count diminishes, patients are at risk for um, opportunistic infections and AIDS and all the complications. Well, in hepatitis B, the virus enters into the liver cell. So the infection is not circulating all over the body like in HIV, but it's focused on the liver. So the hepatitis B virus binds to the liver and enters into the liver. It injects its DNA into the liver cell nucleus, and from there it replicates its life cycle. And one of the things that it releases from the infected cell is HBSAG, or hepatitis B surface antigen, and this is what we detect in blood. This is one of the products of, uh, of the hepatitis B life cycle. And the other thing that it also releases is called viral load, or HBV DNA. And the viral load is what is blocked by tenofovir and lamivudine. Oops. Um, the other thing to mention about the hepatitis B life cycle is that unlike HIV, where the virus kills its host cell, the hepatitis B virus is very happy to live inside of the liver. And, it's, and it does not kill the liver cell. Instead, as I mentioned here in the pink box, it's the host immune response that actually becomes activated and tries to kill the virus. And by trying to kill the virus, the host kills liver cells. And that chronic, that chronic interplay between the virus and the host immune system is what leads to cirrhosis, what leads to liver cancer. So it's actually um, mostly that the host responds to the virus what causes the damage, not the virus directly. Okay, so probably the most common question you will get in the clinic or wherever you're working in Zambia when, when a patient thinks or does have hepatitis B is they'll ask, how did I get this? Because the awareness of the infection is very low in the population. I think in 2019, 
nearly everyone in, in Zambia knows how HIV is transmitted, but most people don't know how hepatitis B is transmitted. So these are, these are five modes of transmission in Zambia. So number one, early childhood transmission horizontally. So the virus is very stable outside of the body and it can be easily spread um, within the household on things like toothbrushes and razor blades. And when you're, a very, when you're a very young child, you don't have a mature immune system. And so many children in early in life, in the, before we had the vaccine, were exposed and infected with the virus. And this is actually the most common mode of transmission in Zambia. And that's why it was so important when the ministry instituted vaccination for young children. Number two is percutaneous. So some people may know that um, hepatitis B virus, because it's more stable in the, vi in the environment, is approximately 100 times more infectious than HIV. And that data comes from needle stick um, post-exposure prophylaxis studies. So they say that if you're stuck by a needle, um, the risk of HIV is approximately 0.3%. And in hepatitis B, if you're non-immune, it can be as much as 30%. So people who have IV drug use, health workers, um, or if, if, uh, unstate, uh, if needles are reused in the health system, this can be a way of transmitting the hepatitis B virus. Number three is sexual transmission. So just like HIV, hepatitis B can be transmitted through unsafe sex. Number four is mother-to-child perinatal transmission. So at the time of delivery, a baby can be exposed to um, the mom's uh, um, you know, vaginal fluids and also to uh, maternal blood and can get infected at that point. There is no in utero transmission and there's no breastfeeding transmission of HPV. And finally, blood transfusion, as I mentioned, um, can transmit HPV. So out of all of these five forms, when a person comes to me in Zambia and says, how did I get hepatitis B? Most, if they were born before 2006, when the vaccine came into play, I usually tell them that was most likely due to early childhood transmission. There are times when we think it's percutaneous or sexual, but I would say that if I had to guess, the first option here is the most common way that people in Zambia got exposed and infected with HPV. So now we have, um, I actually don't know how this is gonna work, but we have a polling question. So, oh, here it is. That's how that's gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Polling number one, okay? So this is just to assess whether you've been paying attention. So the question is, it's a 42-year-old male laboratory worker in Zambia. And by the way, this is an actual uh, real-world case from UTH. A 42-year-old man works in the laboratory. He's in good health, and he goes for a regular medical checkup. Um, He's married, he has four children. The, the medical checkup, uh, he gets an HIV test, a hepatitis B test, and a syphilis test. And out of those three, his HBV result comes back reactive. So which of these is the most likely way that he became HBV positive? Okay. Based upon what I just said, and you have uh, six options. A, exposed to blood, working as a laboratory worker. B, through sex. C, at birth or early childhood. D, through a mosquito bite. E, through an unclean barber shop that he goes to every week. And F, through a traditional tattoo that he had when he was 10 years old. Right, take a minute to think about that. Okay. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, we have some votes coming through in the hub. <laughs> our consensus is the B. <laughs> what is our vote? Yeah, yeah most people have gone for A. Oh, okay, so we are at 58% because most of us have gone for, for A. 
so okay. is the poll done uh we can end it now so most of the people at this point think that the gentleman got hep b from being exposed at his job including some people in the hub okay all right well um so actually oh that's good 63 percent okay and 41 percent thought it was at birth or early childhood okay right so in this case, this 42-year-old man was born before we had vaccination in Zambia. And um, we know from some studies that were done in Africa that most of the transmission occurs in early childhood or at birth. And therefore, although it's possible that he had been exposed at work, it's possible that he had been exposed through sex, um, the most likely scenario is that he actually acquired the infection at birth or early childhood. Now, I will say that if he had been tested in the past and was negative before he started working in the laboratory and now became positive, that would, that would be evidence that he got exposed at work. But since I didn't give you that information, I want you to know that most people actually um, develop this infection in their early childhood. And this is actually not known in Zambia by, by most uh, patients and by providers. So I think that if we were to start doing you know, widespread testing, we would find a lot of cases where um, people have no other specific risk factor and it's just because they got exposed before we had the vaccine when, when the virus was more common. Okay. Can I move on or are there any questions or clarifications? Sure, go ahead. There's a question. Uh, what about acquiring hepatitis B through food? Uh, it does not get transmitted through food. Aside, uh, Dr. Cassidy? Uh, that's hepatitis A that normally gets transmitted through food. So hep B is not food born. It's mostly through blood and uh, oral products. Rather. Yeah. yeah, so not through food. We can move on. But to clarify, when you say not through food, you mean sharing utensils? He's asking about sharing utensils. Uh, there would have to be blood to blood uh, communication at that point. So if you. <laughs> no, it does not, uh, it's not in saliva. So yeah. they say that um, it can be transmitted through sharing a toothbrush, but again, that's blood to blood transmission because yeah. as you know, when you brush your teeth, there's trace particles of blood um, because there's some you know, uh, abrasion on the gums. Thank you very much, Michael. You can go ahead. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so now we're on to testing. All right, so as I was very appreciative that the Kaoma case mentioned all the different hepatitis B tests that they wanted to do, which is wonderful because it means that we're really researching and trying to understand uh, the hepatitis B. Because it's true, this is a confusing disease that has a lot of different tests, but I try to keep it simple when I'm, when I'm teaching people because Basically, there's really only one test we're gonna use for hepatitis B in Zambia right now. And this is the one that the Medical Stores Limited provides to the facilities. Um, it's the easiest one to find at the private uh, labs as well. It's called hepatitis B surface antigen. And if you have just this one test, you can manage the disease and you can take care of patients. And although I know people want to have other tests, the actual usefulness of those other tests is pretty minor. And if you focus on this one test, you will go very far. So very simply, if a person has a positive hepatitis B surface antigen test or HBSAG, that means that they have an active HBV infection. So this is how I interpret it. This means active infection. It means that right now there's hepatitis B in the liver that is replicating and making the surface antigen, which gets into the blood, and that's what we're detecting. 
Um, and then if the hepatitis B surface antigen test comes out negative, it can mean a lot of things. It could mean that they had the infection and it resolved. It could mean that they never had the infection. So when, when that comes out negative, you can just tell the person you have no active infection. This is the way I say it, no active infection. And no active infection equals no further clinical care. So if a person has a negative test, you can discharge them from care and there's no need to repeat it. So in general, it's a very helpful test. If it's positive, you need to do further clinical care. If it's negative, you can discharge the patient. Now, let's talk about hepatitis B rapid testing. So um, I'm part of the hepatitis task force and we, we asked the MSL to provide some information recently for some uh, guidelines we're writing. And according to MSL, they distributed about 24,000 uh, hepatitis B tests in 2018 to the different facilities in Zambia, which is wonderful. Um, so I wanted to just talk about rapid testing because this is the most common type of test that we have in Zambia. So the rapid tests are very, very specific, more than 99.5%. So that means that if it comes out positive, you can be very confident that there's, there's uh, no need to reconfirm it. A positive rapid test is, in my mind, confirms that the person has an active infection. However, I wanna tell you that some of the rapid tests have reduced sensitivity. So I know that in HIV, we're used to a very sensitive test that's more than 99% sensitive. But unfortunately, in hepatitis B, the tests are only 92 to 96% sensitive. So some patients will have a false negative, meaning that you will miss some cases of hepatitis B. So what would you do in that case? If you have a patient who you really suspect has hepatitis B, perhaps like the Kaoma case, where they come in with cirrhosis um, or a liver cancer, you might want to send their blood for a second test to be double sure that it's negative. Um, but generally, this is this is uh, this is the performance of all the of all the rapid tests. Um, the other thing to know about the rapid tests is they are very very similar to the rapid HIV tests that we use. So I consider that any any health worker, even the lay health worker who's been trained to do the rapid HIV diagnosis, um, they could be allowed to perform the hepatitis B test. Uh, the most important additional training they would need is to learn about hepatitis B and provide adequate counseling before and after the test. But as far as the logistics involved, it's very, um, very, very similar to HIV rapid testing and can be done using a finger prick. And so in the Zamfia study, um, they pricked the finger for HIV, they pricked the finger for hepatitis B, and they pricked the finger for syphilis tests uh, all at the same time. Okay, so now we've learned about testing. So who should take one of these tests? So like the Kaoma case we started with, um, any patient who comes to you with signs or symptoms of a liver problem. And so I won't go over all the signs and symptoms, but if you have any thought that this could be hepatitis, uh, you should go ahead and have the person tested. Number two is HIV infected patients. So um, according to the guidelines, we should know the hepatitis B status of all of our HIV patients. And that's because, as I showed from Zamfia, there's a lot of co-infection. And those patients with hepatitis B, um, we need to ensure that they're always on tenofovir in the ARVs. And uh, we might consider monitoring them more closely in certain circumstances. Um, number three is blood donors. Uh, so in any... Any blood bank in Zambia has a platform to do hepatitis B uh, testing. So you might find people coming to you for hepatitis B treatment because they were found out, they were found uh, by the blood bank. Um, number four is kind of a new thing in Zambia, which is about uh, PrEP. So I know you've had several lectures about PrEP in Zambia. And so you just have to remember that um, the PrEP treatments have tenofovir in them. 
and lamivudine sometimes and emtricitabine. And those drugs do work on hepatitis B. Um, and so it's important that you know the status, the hepatitis B status of a person before you start them on PrEP. Um, then number five is contacts. So just like tuberculosis and just like HIV index testing, we have hepatitis B index testing. And so, um, so contacts to people who have a positive surface antigen test should also be tested. And then finally, health workers. I think it should be routine that health workers get tested before they start working in the healthcare setting and then they get vaccinated. I think I saw a question. Okay, I'll continue. Yeah. I think the question was, if most people in Zambia got infected at birth or during childhood, why aren't we doing mass screening for hepatitis B and treating these patients? That's a great question. I think it has to do with competing priorities, uh, political will, um, more than anything else. So I think uh, hepatitis does not have the profile it deserves. So I hope that this talk will help to uh, spread the word, but I totally agree. There should be widespread screening. So there could be more hepatitis B out there than meets the eye, isn't it? Yes, you know, someone estimated that more than 95% are unaware of their status in Zambia, which means they never took a hepatitis B test. Oh, wow. So another population that is screened as a government intervention is pregnant women. Um, I, I'm not aware of any guideline that says that. I know that it's common in private clinics, but um, I have never seen that as a routine procedure in antenatal care. Okay, so uh, you've been asked to emphasize the issue of, about Hep B and PrEP. Why should somebody coming for PrEP go for a Hep B test? Somebody's asking from their hub. They want you to hit a bit more on that point. Sure, let's go back to this. Okay, well, so in hepatitis B, as I'll talk about more in the second part of this, um, this series on hepatitis, not all the patients need treatment. So there are, some, there are some patients, they don't have cirrhosis, they don't have significant liver damage, they can just be observed and their hepatitis B may cause no problems and they may never need to take treatment. But other patients, they do have significant liver problems and they need to be on long-term treatment, such as potentially the patient from coma, coma. And so it's important that you distinguish those two groups of people when you prescribe PrEP. Because ideally, if um, a hepatitis B patient who really needs treatment of hepatitis B goes on PrEP, then they should just stay on it for a long, long time, rather than stopping it when their HIV risk uh, changes. But if the person has no liver disease, um, then potentially they can discontinue PrEP just as they, any other patient would based upon their HIV risk. So uh, if you don't know the hepatitis B status, then you can't know which patients can stop and which can't. I hope okay. I made that point. Thank you so much. So it's about um, inevitably starting somebody who may have Hep B on Hep B treatment. So you need to know if you give PrEP, do they have Hep B anyway? So when I initiate PrEP, I'll go on forever. So we have a landmark moment here in the hub. Our IT person, Chatonda, has a question. You have a lot of questions, Michael. This is... <laughs> Sorry, I'm not hearing the question.
Hello, can you hear us? But how come that study could hear us? <laughs> oh, some people are uh, waiting. So oh, okay. So Sons of Thunder can hear our first Oh, hi, Michael. So, okay, please go ahead. We had issues with our sound. We were talking and somehow we thought this thing is blue. So <laughs> they can hear you, but you were muted. So please go okay. ahead. I'll go ahead. Let's share again. I think we're on oh. polling question two. Oh, wow. This one. Hmm. <laughs> This one. <laughs> I complained, but anyway, let's see. I'm not, I'm not taking for me. I can't come on. I can't try. Okay, so here is polling question two. Do you mind going through it? Sure. Okay, so remember what I said about uh, the different hepatitis B tests. So a patient brings in their hepatitis B test results to you for interpretation. Which of the following four patients has active hepatitis B infection that requires further clinical care? So patient A, this is a person who has hep B surface antibody positive, Hep B surface antigen negative, hepatitis B C, sorry, hepatitis C antibody negative. That's the first person's results. Second person's results says HBS AB negative, hepatitis core AB positive, hepatitis B surface antigen negative. Third patient has hepatitis B surface antigen positive, anti HBC positive hepatitis B surface antibody negative. And the fourth patient comes to you, the results say HCV AB positive, hepatitis B surface antigen negative, HBS AB positive. So you should be really you know, confused now, but at the same time, if you, if you were listening to what I said about the testing in Zambia, you should just hone in on the one you want. So. Please go ahead and pick one of the four answers. Which patient so, needs further care? So we only have eight facilities voting. Now we have nine. We are getting a vote from the hub as well. Okay, so the vote from the hub, is, they've gone for, for C as well. Yeah. So we have 17 people voting. I'm sure you can see that. Okay. So you have the number of people. Okay. So there are your results. I hope you can see that, Michael. Okay, great. So 87% of you got the right answer, which is, a, which is C. So my point of this question, other than uh, to annoy Sambo Feloshi, was to... <laughs> To, be as well. to make the point that um, this is the real world. People will find a private lab that can do these things. And people will come to you with various test results. And you'll wonder, what do I do with all this data? What do I do with all these results? But what I want you to go away with today is find the one that says hepatitis B surface antigen, and then find out if it's positive or negative. If it's positive, they need more clinical care. And if it's negative, you can reassure them that they do not have active infection. 
So that's the summary takeaway is that no matter how many hepatitis B tests are done, you have to focus in on the surface antigen. Yes. All right. So next slide is about health workers. Before I go on, any questions about that? Um, I think there was a question to Macha. Macha has a question. Please go ahead. Macha has a question. But our question was on the treatment. I don't know if he's going to talk on the treatment. Please go ahead with your question. Okay, I'm saying my question. It's uh, on the treatment. I don't know if the presenter is going to say something on the treatment, but uh, our question was uh, 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 which treatment is the best, monotherapy or combined therapy? If it's uh, monotherapy, like the way we are, what Kaoma was doing, using lamipidine, like, what is the, the duration of the treatment? Well, actually, um, the plan today was to give an overview of hepatitis B to make sure that everyone was had a certain amount of knowledge. And then the next time, um, I'll go into the different subtleties around treatment. But to tell you, to give you a brief response, um, you use what is most common in your facility. In that case, it's going to be combination tenofovir with lamivudine or combination tenofovir with emtricitabine. Those are the two that I would recommend as first line at your, if, if they're available at your facility. Um, tenofovir can be used by itself. Lamivudine can be used by itself. But I think the first choice in Zambia is the combined. Thank you very much, Michael. You can go ahead. Okay, so what about health workers? So we actually do not have any data in Zambia on the hepatitis B uh, prevalence in health workers. Um, and actually, I will, I will pause uh, in a second to ask Levy and Wanawasa to, to comment. But uh, I would just say that um, globally, it's recognized that health workers are more at more risk to have hepatitis B than the general population. Therefore, uh, there should be universal screening of health workers for hepatitis B. And the best time to do that is before they begin working in a health facility. So maybe during uh, medical school, during nursing school, during pharmacy school. Um, and then if they're negative at that time, they could receive the immunization, the vaccination. Um, so that would be the ideal way to do it. Um, unfortunately, we haven't really made this a routine practice yet in Zambia, but for any health workers who haven't been tested, they can go and test and they can still get benefits from the vaccine even now. Um, so what about this vaccine? Uh, in the early, uh, sorry, in the extended program on immunizations that is available at any under five clinic, uh, the vaccine is combined with other vaccines to make the pentavalent vaccine. And I'll show you about that in a second. Um, and that's free from the government. Um, however, to get a vaccine for health workers, it requires additional payment out of pocket because it's not provided uh, by the government at this current juncture. Um, and it can be found at private pharmacies. You know, in my experience, the cost is around 100 to 150 kwacha per dose, and you need three doses at zero, one, and six months. And I will say that some pharmacies stock out because the demand is not that high yet. So here's a little bit more about the vaccine. So as I mentioned, if you look at an under five card, this is my daughter's under five card. You can see that in the pentavalent at six weeks and then, you know, late, and then two additional doses, it says DPT, Hep B, and Hip. So just for you guys to be aware that we are vaccinating all children for Hep B, and this is wonderful because it means that in the future, the prevalence will be greatly reduced. Um, if an adult, for example, a health worker wants to get vaccinated, you do not want to get the pentavalent. 
DPT, Hep B, Hep. You want to get a standalone vaccine that is just for hepatitis B. And the other thing to mention about the vaccine on this slide is that it's incredibly safe. It's probably the safest vaccine that we use. Um, it's not made from a lot, it's not, doesn't contain a live virus. Um, the side effects are really limited. And even if you've already had the vaccine and you need to get an extra dose, there is no consequence from that. So um, we generally err on the side of giving an extra dose. If you're not sure how many you've had, then to, then to stop early. You want to make sure people have three doses. That's why children receive three doses. And these are data from Zamfia. Again, I mentioned that Zamfia was a very important study for the hepatitis B policymakers as well. Because what Zamfia showed was that the hepatitis B vaccine is already showing benefits for children in Zambia. Um, so as I mentioned, five, about 5% 5 of adults have active hepatitis B infection. And when Zamfia looked at children born after the vaccine was put into place, those would be children from zero to 10 years old, zero to nine years old, it was only 0.7%. And so um, that can really only be attributed to the, the benefits of the vaccine. And so uh, we can see that in this day and age, just by getting your child the, vac the regular vaccines at the under five clinic, you can reduce their risk in Zambia to less than 1%, which is wonderful. So how do we vaccinate a health worker? So um, I've, I've done this at CIDRS um, with some health workers and also in other settings. And so usually what we recommend is first, the hepatitis B surface antigen test. Um, and then if your laboratory has additional capacity, you could do the antibody test. It's called hepatitis B surface antibody. So you see the end of the abbreviation has AB, meaning antibody. And this would tell you if the person has already, has already um, immunity against the virus. Um, then if there's no immunity, meaning this antibody is negative, or you don't have that test and the surface antigen is negative, you give three doses of vaccine at zero, times zero, meaning today, and then in one month, and then in six months. And we usually try to provide uh, a record book, just like the yellow book for, I mean, I'm sure you've, you know the yellow book from the yellow fever vaccine. Well, that same yellow book, you can record other vaccines and uh, you would want to write in the book when you gave the vaccine so that you can keep track. Because health workers tend to move around in their system, and so it's good if they keep track of their own vaccination. And keep in mind that if you only manage to give one dose of vaccine, that only gives about 60% of the protection. And so it's really important to get the second and the third doses. And as I mentioned before, this is a very safe vaccine. Um, it's you know, slightly costly, uh, but it's, uh, I think it's, it's worth the investment um, for health workers. And so if any health worker comes to me and says they started, but they didn't complete the series, I recommend just starting over. Just start over and get three doses again. Um, there's really uh, no significant consequence of doing that. Someone might ask me, well, what if we vaccinate a person who has hepatitis B surface antigen positivity? Again, you're not going to cause any, any safety issues. And since the person is already carrying the virus actively, um, they're not going to have any benefits, but there's no consequence. So I think I saw some questions. Let me stop there. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Vinegar. I wanted to ask about triple elimination. Zambia is going for dual elimination of both um, syphilis and uh, HIV. Are there some countries that are going for triple, and what's the third one? Is it hepatitis B? I'm not aware. Sorry, I don't know. Okay, so Chilenge has got a couple of questions. Please go ahead. Chilene J, I believe that's Dr. Onoya and uh, Chimunyan team. 
please go ahead. Unfortunately, we are the second case, but we have a lot of, of questions. So, um, so uh, yes, Dr. Onoya, please go ahead with your question. Yeah, thank you. I would like to thank, uh, to thank Dr. Michael for the presentation. I've got uh, a good number of questions, but uh, I'm going to ask some. <laughs> Wow, Dr. Onoya, how many questions do you have? What is good and what is bad? We we'll allow you to. Uh, is it uh, okay? Let me ask uh, three questions for now. Two. I said two, Dr. Onoya, because we we'll have part two of the hepatitis B, and I know a lot of people are itching for the treatment, and he wants to preserve that. So let's take two of your most pressing questions, Dr. Onoya. <laughs> My first question uh, is that I'm not uh, come out clear. When should we initiate the treatment? Because we know that when we look at the history of uh, B, sometimes the virus can be cleared without any treatment. So we know we have uh, acute hepatitis B, chronic hepatitis B. Uh, from uh, what Dr. Mike was yeah. it's like we can only uh, initiate the treatment when there are uh, liver complications. So my first question is to know when can we start the treatment when the antigen uh, test comes out negative, uh, positive, I mean. <laughs> the second question, uh, we know that uh, uh, there is hepatitis D that uh, goes along with uh, hepatitis B. So are we supposed to test to screen also for hepatitis D uh, or we just ignore it? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Onoya. So Michael, Onoya is bordering on, I think your part two, <laughs> the one where you're going to have to come back. Uh, he says he has not heard you talk about when do you treat hepatitis B? Sure. Um, yeah, so please come to the treatment lecture. We'll go over, I'll teach you, I'll teach you a five-step approach um, on how to treat it. And, but in very brief summary, I would refer you to the 2018 HIV AIDS guideline book, that green one with the tree on the front. Um, if, you, if you look in there, I think it's pages 43 to 47. Um, there are four pages about hepatitis B in patients without HIV. And I think from there, you can already answer some of your own questions, but I'll go into details in the future. And then your second question uh, was about, lost it. He's asking about hepatitis, the hep oh, D. Delta. Yeah, so we call it Delta um, in the hepatitis world. And actually, um, Yes, so Delta is out there. We don't know really uh, how many patients in Zambia have it, because I actually have uh, really not seen a lot of cases, and we don't have any tests for it. So to be honest, uh, I wouldn't worry about it right now, but it's something that we need to do um, with the ministry as a surveillance so that we can understand if it's a problem in Zambia or not. Um, but at the current time, uh, you won't find any any laboratory that will do a test that I uh, like a good test for it. So I wouldn't really worry about it. Okay, so that's a surveillance question. So we are getting a nudge here. Um, what are the signs and symptoms of hepatitis B? Well, I would say that most people that you will encounter will have no signs or symptoms whatsoever. The disease can be asymptomatic for a long, long time. And this is what it's, yeah, it's another one of those quote unquote silent killers, just like high blood pressure, right? When a patient has high blood pressure, we tell them they have high blood pressure and if they don't do something about it, they'll have a stroke or a heart attack. Well, in hepatitis B, it's the same thing. Um, some patients, we think about 25 to 40% will have no symptoms for many, many years, and then they'll develop cirrhosis or liver cancer, just like the patient in Kaoma. Um, but there's a period without symptoms. So that's the most common scenario. Other patients will come to you with acute hepatitis B, 
they have just acquired it and their body is reacting in the form of jaundice and fever and uh, abdominal pain. So, um, so those are also possible symptoms. But going back to chronic form, um, you know, you would look for a patient who has uh, ascites or other signs of decompensated liver disease, such as uh, uh, spider angiomas, um, portal hypertension, and the like. Well, that's very helpful. Do you mind going on with your presentation? Sure. Okay, so I think we're on to polling question number three. Which of these individuals should be tested for hepatitis B according to what I just told you in this presentation? A patient who comes in with meningitis, a student who's preparing to go to university, uh, a bus driver, or a person, sorry, I meant to say a bus driver who is um, you know, in contact with a lot of people on this bus, and then D is a person who has high risk sex and is being evaluated for PrEP. Which of these four individuals should be tested for hepatitis B according to our current uh, testing guidelines in Zambia? Okay, Michael, are you able to see what's happening? You have 26 people what? have voted. Some people feel it's somebody who has meningitis. Sorry? So we also have some votes. Okay, hi, Michael. I hope you can see that. Okay, great. So 97% uh, of you are correct. Um, <laughs> So a person with meningitis, uh, meningitis is really not um, uh, a, a consequence of hepatitis B. Um, a student preparing to uni go to university, of course, I would never refuse for them to get tested if they ask for it, but it's really not a recommendation from our public health authority. Uh, and a bus driver uh, would not consider them to be likely to spread it because uh, person-to-person -person handshaking or uh, um, contact, casual contact does not spread the virus. So the only person here who absolutely should be tested is the patient uh, about to start PrEP. And again, the reason for that is to evaluate if you're aware that they have hepatitis, which we know should be about 5% of the time, then you would want to um, assess them for long-term treatment. Thank you very much, Michael. However, I know that we've had uh, student, people who are trying to go abroad, they do get, we get a lot of hepatitis B tests being requested. What's your comment on this? That's, um, I would say, <laughs> I have also seen that. And it's, it's um, unfortunately, it sort of leads to stigma. So my experiences have been that um, students from Zambia who get scholarships to Russia, China, um, other parts of Asia, they're, they're requested to take a hepatitis B test, and if it comes back reactive, sometimes that can compromise their scholarships. And I think the rationale is that the, um, those countries, they're very well um, informed about hepatitis, and they know that it causes increased uh, healthcare costs. Um, but I think that sometimes it makes our students uh, in Zambia feel a bit uh, discriminated. Thank you very much. Aside feeling discriminated, discriminated, I think a hepatitis B diagnosis is something that brings on a lot of panic on both the healthcare worker and the patient. So it would be interesting to, to hear you do part two. Dr. Mpeti. Yeah, um, um, Michael, it would be interesting to learn of your comment, uh, especially with regards to um, students preparing for university, you being part of hepatitis B in Zambia. Um, just last week, uh, university was almost threatened to be closed because four students tested positive for hepatitis B. That's your comment. Hey Michael, uh, did you hear that? I, it was coming and going, but you said that uh, a university was closed because 
students have hepatitis Threatened. B? Threatened because four students uh, presented to a certain clinic in Lusaka and during the routine tests, they found that uh, uh, four of them were positive, tested positive to hepatitis B. And uh, the health authorities went full throttle for this university that um, it should close, either vaccinate your students or close. What's your comment? Yeah, well, I think my comment is that, um, you know, there needs to be more awareness raising of hepatitis B because um, it's very widespread in the population. And as I mentioned, the most likely form of transmission is in early childhood for someone who was born before 2006. Um, and so I think that in Europe and in the US, uh, hepatitis B is more a sexually transmitted infection because they've already wiped away all of the early childhood transmission. So they're just left with sexual transmission. But um, so I would think, so unfortunately there's a link there. And when people uh, have hepatitis, uh, they sometimes are accused of being promiscuous um, or having unsafe sex. And it's not always, that's not always, often it's not the case. Um, so I would say that probably the health authority who is, um, who is trying to uh, bring that case against the university should probably, um, you know, get some better information about the disease. Um, and, you know, I need to know more details, I think, to provide more specific advice. Yeah, thank you, Michael. That sounds quite right. I think we need more information. I think we can now wind up. Okay, so we're on to the summary of key points. So I know that there are many questions. I can see that my, uh, the chat box popping left and right. Um, so, and I know that when I do these presentations, uh, there are usually more questions than answers. Um, but I do wanna say that, please come to the second part on hepatitis B. Um, we'll be, I'll be talking about the practicalities of treating these patients, because I think that um, now that you have the background of the problem, uh, you're, you'll be well equipped to treat at almost any clinic in Zambia. And I think you'll be surprised at how easy it is actually. So the first key point from today's talk is that you should be aware 5% of adults uh, walking around in Zambia have active hepatitis B infection. Uh, worldwide, hepatitis B, chronic hepatitis B is 10 times as common as HIV. And remember what I said, most people are unaware of their infection. And so it's not at all surprising to me when a person tests positive because we know 5%, that's a, that's more than 400,000 uh, Zambians. So key point number two, the, the hepatitis B virus can be spread in many different ways, including sex, including in theoretically uh, unsafe needles, um, tattooing, many ways it can be spread. However, most adults you'll come across in Zambia who test positive were actually infected at birth or in early childhood. And I usually, try to emphasize this point with my patients so that they don't feel stigmatized or like they've done something wrong. Most people were infected before they were you know, able to walk. So key point number three. Um, remember, as you scale up, I know you're gonna be scaling up PrEP services in 2019. And as you are introducing PrEP in your clinics, I think it's important that you also make sure you have hepatitis B testing kits available. Um, if you don't have a testing kit, I think it's okay for you to start PrEP. Um, but just make sure during the follow-up you get that hepatitis B test. The most important time to be aware of it is if the patient wants to stop PrEP. Because if they have hepatitis B and significant liver disease, then they should just continue the PrEP um, for a long time to treat the hepatitis rather than stopping. So again, please uh, get your PrEP patients tested, but I think if it's urgent to get them onto PrEP, that, shouldn't, that could be done even in the absence of a test, and you could do the testing at a, at a subsequent visit, because I know that these testing kits stock out sometimes. And then key point number four 
is health workers should know their status for hepatitis B and should be vaccinated ideally before they enter the workforce. Um, and so I think that um, if there are any of you who are, uh, you know, who are activists uh, and you want to work in this space, I think you should work with the universities, um, the, the professional schools that are training doctors, nurses, pharmacists, lab people, and they, those universities could start offering uh, testing and vaccination programs because that's the, that's the most effective moment to, to start uh, protecting health workers before they get into the workforce. Thank you very much, Michael. It's four o'clock. We, we had a case from Chifundo, but it's more on treatment. So I think we'll skip that one and move it to part two. I think even on part two, we may do a case on most people we see with hepatitis B who are actually just asymptomatic, happily walking around and boom, somebody somehow tested for hepatitis B and it's positive. So what to do? I know Dr. Onoya has a lot of questions, so we'll save those for part two as well. Dr. Cassidy, do you have something to say? Uh, no, I just want to uh, emphasize the point that Dr. Michael has brought out is, I think everyone's probably familiar with all of the information on hepatitis B, but the information on, on PrEP is likely new. Uh, and, and really, uh, having hepatitis B is not a contraindication to starting PrEP, not at all. It's just that when you go, when the patient wants to stop PrEP, they're then at risk for a hepatitis flare if they are already on PrEP. So they have to be monitored in that regard. So the decision to stop PrEP therapy is not so simple in a hepatitis B patient. I think that's the, one of the key pieces of new information. So just to highlight that once, one more time. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Dr. Nsokolo, any comments? It looks like Hep B is the big thing. I wouldn't say it's the next big thing. It's like we do have Hep B, but probably neglected. I won't say tropical. <laughs> Some sort of neglected disease because it is in our population, isn't it? Dr. Nsokolo. Yeah, yes, yes. It's uh, one of these uh, problems that we really need to emphasize and try and educate our people. But one other thing I just need to emphasize is that, um, just like Dr. Michael was saying, uh, it's not just in Zambia where you have most of the people getting the infection during childhood. And um, uh, this has been shown that in high prevalence areas, this is the highest mode of transmission, the most common mode of transmission, if your prevalence is high. Because as we are aware that those people who get infection during childhood, the majority of them, more than 90%, will go on to develop chronic infection and those who get it during uh, adulthood sexually or by any other contacts with body fluids, uh, more than 90% uh, of them will clear the infection. So basically this is something that is known worldwide that if your prevalence is high like it is for us where it is high intermediate, the most common mode of transmission is during childhood. Then just to uh, also mention that the other thing here at Levy, we do screen all the workers here and uh, the hospital actually purchases the vaccine for the workers. All those that are uh, hepatitis B positive, they come to our clinic, we screen them for uh, eligibility for treatment and those who are not, the hospital actually buys a vaccine for them and they get vaccinated. So probably other centers may take it up and try to, to do the same in order to, to help the the health workers. Thank you very much, and we look forward to the presentation on treatment. Thank you so much, Dr. Nsokolo. Well done, Levy, for doing that. I know UTH also tries to buy some vaccines, but obviously when you are dealing with a big number of healthcare workers, you may have uh, issues, of course. So, Michael, there you go. You've managed to end yourself part two. <laughs> You've done very good advocacy work on that, so thank you very much. Chifundo, uh, Chifundo Clinic, I'm so sorry, we'll move your case to next week because it's actually more about treatment. It's a very, very interesting case because that's what's happening on the, on the ground in terms of availability of the loose tenofovir and AZT in the context of renal failure. But thank you so much. I think we've all heard Zambia is in the high intermediate. So we have a high prevalence of hepatitis B and our children are at risk as they are growing, especially if you're born before 2006 like most people here. <laughs> so we need to get tested for hepatitis B and get that vaccine. It's affordable and usually actually hospitals are 
um, can buy. But I think what we've learned is that hepatitis B needs a voice. So we need advocates for hepatitis B. Well done, Michael. Thank you very much. So next, next week we are talking about index testing with Dr. Kandio and Dr. Maureen Simenda from USAID Step. We'll see you then. Thank you so much, everyone in the network. We want to encourage you to submit your registers and uh, we look forward to part two of hepatitis B. Thank you so much. I think you can. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Sokolo, you can just switch off. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, bye.